Please be seated. A letter from the rector and rural dean of Rye, the Reverend Canon David Frost, to the clergy and people of Christ Church, Rye, New York. Advent 2015, dear friends. Greetings to all the church family in Rye, from all of us in Rye, Sussex, as you celebrate Rye England Sunday. It's so good that we continue this tradition of prayer and support between our two churches that started in 1942. This year at our 10.30 a.m. service, we intend to sing the Star Spangled Banner as a gesture of solidarity with you. The music was, of course, written by an Englishman. <laughs> <laughs> John Stafford Smith, who was for a time the organist at Gloucester Cathedral. It's very mild on the south coast of England with no sign of snow, although we are being buffeted by the tail end of various Atlantic storms. Yet again, we are without any heating. So we pray that our welcome is warm, even if our ancient church building is not. The terrorist outrage in Paris has affected us partly because it's so close to this part of England, less than two hours on the train. Many of our church family have friends in northern France, and I have often preached in St. Michael's, one of the Anglican churches in the city, and the chaplain is a close friend. We do, however, feel uneasy that we've been so affected by this news when similar events are happening with alarming regularity all over the world. Human beings in Afghanistan and Syria are just as precious to God as those who live in Western Europe. We give thanks that we live in a very peaceful part of the world, largely free from the crime and violence that affects other cities in England and elsewhere. But it's all too easy to assume this in the norm when we know that it is not. As you know, St. Mary's is the most visited church in Sussex with 150,000 people coming through the doors each year. We're always looking for new ways for them to encounter not just a beautiful building, but the living Christ, whose birth we are soon to celebrate. It is our earnest desire that our visitors may become pilgrims because of something they have heard or seen in St. Mary's Church. It's our prayer that in both Rye, New York, and Rye, Sussex, the Advent hope will become a living reality as we seek to reach people with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, with our love and prayers, Canon David Frost. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. <clears throat> I bet some of you are wondering, given the events in San Bernardino this week, whether I'm going to preach again about gun violence and gun control. And I'm not, because I did. I went back and checked October the 4th of this year, and that sermon is still available on the Christchurch website. And you should know that I have an informal email list of parishioners who continue to be in conversation about the issue of responsible gun ownership. And if you would like to be on that list, send me an email. And I will add you, we share articles and research from time to time. And it is Advent, isn't it? I've been surprised a little bit over the last few weeks at the number of people who, this year for some reason, have asked me if I believe in the second coming of Christ. Now, I shouldn't be surprised because actually that's very timely. Did you know that we use the word advent or coming at this time of year to anticipate the second coming of Christ at the end of time. Outside, it's all about the first coming of Jesus, right? The Christmas decorations and all of that is about our eager anticipation of the coming of the baby Jesus in Bethlehem with the shepherds and the angels. And we love that. And so we spend Advent thinking about the first coming of Jesus. But actually, the church, 
for hundreds of years has suggested that as the days are growing shorter and the nights are growing longer and darker, that we should actually be preparing for his coming back, a day of judgment. Now, I have to admit, I'm a little uncomfortable when people ask me if I personally believe in the second coming of Christ because it's a little too much like one of those gotcha questions. You believe he's going to come robed in majesty, coming down from the heavens, sort of reversing the ascension. He's going to come back with all his angels. And in the hymns we sing, every eye will see him, every one behold him, and we'll all know who it is. And no, I'm actually not fixed on that, to tell you the truth. But I do hold on to it, and I'll tell you why. Because what it tells me, and what this season tells me, is that there is going to be a time's up, pencils down. Do you know what I mean by time's up, pencils down? Anybody who's taken a standardized test lately? You know that if you didn't get 14, <laughs> Question number 14, it's over. <laughs> no more trying. There is an end point. There is what we call a day of reckoning when we are judged. Now, in a personal sense, that's the day we die. There's a moment after which what we never said will never be said, and what we never got done will never get done. And what we never gave will never be given. There's a period at the end of our sentence. There's an end. And we hope and pray that if there's a beautiful funeral here, someone will step into that lectern and say wonderful things about how generous we were and how faithful and steadfast and how we loved our families and served our communities. And We will be judged. We will be judged. There's a there's a time out, time's up moment, personally, for each of us. But when we go to the day of reckoning scenario, you know, the paintings in the museums are never a single person in front of the throne of God. They're throngs of people, throngs of people, sometimes sheep and goats being separated, right? There are the just and the unjust, the righteous and the unrighteous, there's a separating out, a teasing out of what was good and what was bad, but it's for us. It's a generational social thing. Now, maybe you don't believe that God will do that, that God will assemble us all and sort it out and say, sorry you, over there. <laughs> But know this, if God does not judge us, history will. History will judge us. So there is a kind of judgment, an end time, an end point, and yes, we should worry about it. We should worry about it. Now this is stewardship season, right? In the church, we use that word a lot, and you know that it's code for please make a pledge and write a check. You know that it's the time when we check the church's physical resources against its demands, and we try to be sure that we have enough money to keep the lights on and keep the heat going and make sure that we have Sunday school rooms, that we can carry out the work we have to do. And if you were to ask me, do I lie awake at night worrying about whether that's going to come out OK? Ah, sometimes. But you know what worries me more? What worries me more is will Christ's church serve the world the way we're meant to do? The money will work out. We're good at that. We're good at that. Yes, I want you to pledge, but I know you will. We'll work that out. But for what? Will we be, either to be able to gather ourselves up and move forward together 
to do the work that God is giving us to do? Will we be able to summon the will, the courage, the consensus to move forward as a vessel of God's love? Will this room in the next 365 days be the place you want to be when the going is rough? Can we make that so? And what about this stewardship thing? You know, we like to talk about time and talent and treasure. You know, and to be honest, I've never liked that trio. It sounds a little trite to me. It's our way of saying, well, it's not all about the money. At the, you know, at the same point that you're saying, actually, really, right now, it's about the money. <clears throat> but we talk about how we manage our time, our attention, and our love. Someday, time will be up. How are we doing? How are we doing? How are we spending our time, our attention, and our love? Are we using it? Is it active in the world? Or are we holding back? Are we holding back? Because our time is our life. My husband pointed out to me a couple of weeks ago that in affluent areas like ours where we have enough food and we have roofs over our heads and enough clothes, thank you very much, we can come up with money. We can't come up with time. It's actually a more precious commodity in communities like ours. And if you want to know what your priorities really are and what you really care about, you know, we used to say, look at your checkbook. I'm going to say, look at your calendar. Where is your time going? Where are you spending it? Where's your attention? Remember when my husband and I were first dating, we walked into Saks Fifth Avenue, and he doesn't like to shop at all. We walked past this huge array of flowers. I mean, it was just gorgeous. And he grabbed my arm, and he said, what are you looking at? Because I wasn't looking at the flowers, right? And they're enormous. It was the most beautiful thing in the room. And I was seeing gloves and cologne and, you know, <laughs> foundation and all of this. It's like, no, you're, the busyness, the business of the store was distracting me from a thing of beauty. How we direct our time, our gaze, it's what we have to work with. It's what our lives become. And we don't have forever to work that out. We don't have forever in this body, on this earth, to work that out. There will be a time's up. There will be a time's up. And what will history, the family, say of us? What will they say? I had a little look back this week um, because I saw something on the internet that said that Anne Frank had been an applicant to take refuge in the United States in 1939. Did you know this? I went to the fact checkers and it's true. In 2007 letters were found from Otto Frank, her father, seeking refugee status for his family in the United States. They were not granted refugee status. There was concern in the American community that even children could somehow be used by the Nazis to come in behind enemy lines somehow and destroy our defense in the course of what would become a war. So they were denied entrance. Otto Frank himself was offered entrance to Cuba effective December 1, 1941. Think about that date. 1941, December 1. He was going to come alone and try to work it out and bring his family over. But within 10 days, what had happened? Pearl Harbor 
and Germany and Italy had declared war, so he too was denied refuge here. Looking back, looking back, was that the right decision? Was that the right decision? I went back and read up a little bit more on this because there was anxiety in the United States coming out of the Depression, completely understandable, that there wouldn't be enough jobs for immigrants if they came in. Does this sound familiar? There was anxiety that if immigrants came in from other parts of the world, they would take jobs away from American citizens. Have you heard that before? Right? And there was worry that the Jews, even though they were being victimized all over Europe by the Nazis, would somehow bring us down from within. Does that also sound familiar? If you substitute Syrian fleeing persecution by ISIS for Jew fleeing Holocaust, what do you come up with? What do you come up with? These are important and complicated decisions. We have to think, we have to pray. But Jesus was so very clear about this. He said, the one who wants to save his life will lose it. The man or woman who acts to protect their own lives will lose that life. The ones who lose their lives for Jesus' sake in the Gospels, though, will find themselves very much alive. The ones who take the risk will find life, not lose life. Let's not cower. Let's not cower. Can we spend our lives in order to gain salvation? Do you remember the talents parable that Jesus told where there were three servants and one of them he entrusted five talents, this is money, he gave them five talents and to one he gave three and to one he gave one and then he went off and when he came back the servant with the five talents had invested and doubled it to ten and the servant with three had invested and doubled it to six but the third servant had buried the talent in the ground and when the master came back and said, why did you do that? He said, well, I knew you were a hard man. And I thought you'd be angry with me. And that the best and safest thing to do was to protect it. <clears throat> and the master was furious. Furious. Now, I used to think, mean man, right? The guy was right. He's a hard master. Look, now he's all, now he's all angry. But, you know, I finally got it. When the servant buried the talent in the ground, he was burying his own life. He was burying the risk. He was burying his opportunity to do something good in the world. He was burying what he'd been given to use. To use. How will you use your life? How will you spend it? Your time, your attention, your money, your security. How will you use it? Stewardship means we gather it up and with a great sense of purpose deliver it into the world. Stewardship means we realize what we've been given. Huge amounts of love, attention, food, rain, sunshine, trees, flowers, people, kittens, dogs, all manner of wonderful things, and we receive it, and we're meant to, to direct it and to give it. If we hold back, we lose. If we hold back, we lose. Jesus said to his disciples that nothing would be given that would not be repaid many times over that no sacrifice would be left unnoticed, but we have to spend our time, give our attention, share what we have, so that we may have it more abundantly. He never counseled self-defense. 
He never recommended cowardice. He never invoked violence. He would not even allow his disciples to fight when he was arrested and led to the cross. And we are his followers, his imitators. I believe that God looks down upon us in this hour with great love, with some pleasure, and with great concern. God knows the times are hard. Will you keep your ear to the heart of God and listen to the conversation that goes on within yourselves to be open, to be kind, to be welcoming, to be patient, and in the end, to be confident.